Okay. All right. Well, we don't have on Good morning, today. everybody. This is John Sviokla from GAI Insights. We're here with Tanya and David to do today's news. We're going to tell you what's important, what's essential, and what is optional in the world of AI news. And Tanya's going to take us through today. Tanya, go for it. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So we're a smaller crew today because some of us were at the at the MIT program. So, um, you know, flights and all of that. But we'll do our very best in reviewing the I think we have about five to six articles. Um, we have two announcements from Meta. Um, very interesting. New models as well as new chatbots. So we'll learn about that. Um, we have two uh, use cases for manufacturing companies, Honeywell and Bosch, and how they are using AI uh, to move the needle forward in different areas. And then we also have an article on a company called Nothing, <laughs> um, Nothing Phone. So we'll learn about how they're integrating ChatGPT and we'll close out with an article on Lingo2. So let's get started. Um, Christopher, we have, welcome. We have Ankaj. Um, I will oh, be the yes, Ankaj sure, today. <laughs> I'm Ankaj today. Oh, all right. So let's, uh, let's pull up the Llama one. Thank you, David. All righty. Here it is. So, you know, probably the biggest news of the day, the announcement of Llama 3. And uh, in a second, we'll also kind of talk about how this is being used by Meta uh, to uh, integrate into many of its products. Yeah, I I thought, um, I don't know if we want to consider the two Llama articles together. Yeah, uh, Meta is so, Yes. The uh, but I I first when I first read the the thing about um, just the model and its relative performance and so forth I thought it was optional you know just another entry it's not beating the big the best models and so forth although it's hanging in there with them but then I went back through and looked at the second article that looked at the relationship of search within Facebook and um, and then compared it to went to one of the robots and helped compare it to the previous search they had before and. I think the you know as I as I hacked around with the search uh, the AI search within Facebook, I actually think this is important news because Facebook is such a massive platform and how you know how it's now integrated into that experience and and it's fun. I mean you know you can search Facebook, you can search content, you can generate pictures. You know you start looking at that and I I, I elevated it to important because of that. So. I'm with you, John, because it integrates with all their four main products: WhatsApp. Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. and it's really, again, a step towards how search is going to change and Google, watch out, right? We're all going to move away from the Google uh, little one-liner there. Um, so yeah. I, I, I also gave it a, an important. Well, interestingly, though, it says that the search that's integrated is going to be Bing and Google. So um, I thought that was interesting. Um, a couple of other additional notes, I checked the the Hugging Face leaderboard, and this is now number five. So it's actually gone ahead of um, Mistral, which was the top open source uh, model before this came out. So vaults right to the top. And uh, th something that I thought was cool um, is that apparently if you try to have it generate an image, it's so fast that as you're typing, it starts to generate the image, which is amazing. Um, and also that you can animate images. So having this in integrated into Instagram, you know, you can imagine obviously somebody's going to be able to kind of generate the image that they want to go up on Instagram as they're using it. Um, so I I also see this as important. I almost feel essential about it. Um, so but I will follow up with you, David, on that. I would call it essential. Um, really, because not only is it an open source project, it is now going to show up in your meta feeds. I, I started using it last night. There's a meta button now on um, the first one I used. It was under Lex Friedman, and he was doing a jujitsu uh, picture like in his post, right? And it immediately underneath explains to you what jujitsu is by having prompts you can click on right within the feed. And what's amazing on the search side is that you can say find a jujitsu uh training shop near me so i was able to click that and it pulled up it, the first question it asked was like great what city are you in and i put in my city and it went to search and pulled back the results right in the social feed in a way that i we never had before 
So I think oh, that's clever insane. advertising. <laughs> yes. I, and I'm thinking about what that means for sure when I saw that yesterday. So I, I consider this an essential move because not only is it open source, um, Meta is using it as their model going live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I, 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 I can. I, you're persuading me that it is essential. Yeah. David, back to the. I didn't see the Google um, and, and Bing integration. It's. I thought it, they're creating their own search inside, as in, in terms of that they're actually using the Llama model to help. I, I may have read it wrong. Like maybe it said like Google and Bing, but I'm pretty sure um, I can't go back to it because I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty sure that it said Google Bing search uh, if you wanted it, that you could call that up. Okay. Yeah, yeah I but... recall also the integration with the four meta, meta apps. But yeah, we'll have to take a look. But why don't we mark it essential? Because it is, I mean, it is Facebook. We heard yesterday that open source, you know, is, is, important right to keep in mind as as executives make decisions on on what uh what product to use so let's mark it essential it's not too long of a read and let's move on to the next all right um, which would be uh i think that's the honeywell yes yes sorry i'm not queued up i was i had it scrolled to the end for reading it <laughs> <laughs> not a problem yeah, I'll give so this, I'll give this thing an optional the um you know it's a general discussion you know, maybe, you know, it's part of their venture beat, the venture beat, you know, AI tour thing with, uh, you know, the multi-city tour. It's a write-up of an interview. Um, you know, Honeywell's uh, net profit in 2023 is $9.1 billion. Uh, you know, this is a general, hey, we probably got $10 million here. We probably got $10 million there kind of article. So I give it, personally, I thought it was optional. You surprised me, John. I thought you were going to go important on this one. <laughs> no. uh, and there's the, well, there's not enough specific. She gave categorical areas, but no, no, hey, we spent this, we got this, we did it this way kind of story. Yeah, they there's said there's 24 really nice projects. Go ahead, Chris. There's a really nice graphic. Yeah, that, that's what I liked the most about this article was this graphic. That way, if you were a CTO or a CIO, you'd be able to see that graphic alone and see where the initial spends probably in your AI budget are going to go to. So I, I, I sort of like that um, that setup. Obviously, a strong Microsoft um, offering, but the GitHub for coding. Um, and then they were looking at AWS. So my, that might be some owned computes that they bolted on. And then uh, there's like that open source or open choice, open source or the four and five. So it's a nice little uh, overview of uh, their investment in AI with that 100,000 or 100 million. So yeah. what I, range did you give it, Chris? I, I would say important just because of that. It also like, I I like the fact that at least they're showing initiative. I don't think it's, uh, I, I'm with John, it's not the biggest investment for someone of their size, but um, at least it's a positive move showing that they're going to make a spend uh, somewhat immediately in generative AI. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, and the, in the article, they also talk about, um, you know, for a big company, like to go on record saying, hey, this is how much we've saved is a bold move because a lot of companies are still kind of struggling, right? How do we, how do we show the value of AI? So um, I do think that it gives a little bit of, of insight on, on or it makes you think about, well, if they were able to justify this and track the value of AI and how it's helping them, you know, maybe there's something there, right, to dig a little bit deeper. Yes, um, I thought, so. I think it's nice too, because they also talk about their strategy and how they're executing across the organization. You know, they explain that they have a central generative AI council and that they're uh, trying to make sure that they are cognizant of projects that are going on around the company and shut down any kind of like shadow IT work, et cetera. So I, I thought this was a useful article as well. I, I would say important. Good, awesome. good, good principles, right? <laughs> to follow. All right. We'll go All with right. important. Thank you. <laughs> We've convinced you. I'm just trying to save us some great inflation here. <laughs> <laughs> you told us to be less strict, John. We're trying to honor your wishes here <laughs> now this on the other hand i think is important the uh because the the but i, I feel like this thing's important because the um i thought it was really cool how they use generative ai to create synthetic data to train their models for manufacturing processes uh, I and mean, when you think of it when you when you're using um 
you know, uh, AI for inspection in highly uh, and high quality manufacturing, you may not have a lot of errors to train the thing on to look for those errors. So I think, you know what I mean? You're kind of it's catch 22. Hey, we've got a great manufacturing process. We want to make it better. We don't have enough errors to train the thing to spot the errors. And these two, uh, you know, um, Tino and Ria there uh, came up with a way to use generative AI to create the errors so they could, uh, or Timo, sorry, uh, you know, to create the errors synthetically uh, to then train the model to find the other errors. I thought that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So I gave it an important. You know, I, I agree. I, I think also the just this concept, right, of, of imaging and, and so much being done, right? We heard, um, what was it, maybe two, three weeks ago on on what Bayer is doing, right, with all bringing all the radiology images into one place and also doing the mm -hmm. same thing, you know, creating their own data to train these models, not just using what's out there. Um, there's just so much that can be done now with imaging and not just like do better diagnosis or, or figuring out, uh, you know, where there are errors, but just that whole idea of helping the employee. I mean, can you imagine how boring it must be if that is your job to just look, <laughs> look, and now you have, you know, the robots to really, to really help. So I, I think it was, it's this one and, and Honeywell, I, I gave them both important because I think they're both good use cases for, for our target to our target audience to read. Chris, where are yeah. you? Important. I, I, I'm still um, jazzed up about yesterday, so I'll, I'll be a little <laughs> bit more lenient today. But it's great to, it's great to see an OEM um, really grab the data in a way that's meaningful for them. Um, yeah. It'll give them an amazing advantage within one year uh, yeah. if they start getting this data together now. Yeah, for those for, for our viewers who don't know, we're, we were all at a conference called Imagination in Action at MIT yesterday that had... Uh, about 1,500 people there, uh, you know, well over 100 speakers, business technical, you know, uh, Lex Friedman, you know, Stephen Wolfram. It's just uh, just a fantastic event. So our AI aperture has been opened up. Right. And uh, Lama dropped right around the time that Jan LeCun was speaking, although he was speaking remotely. Um, it was uh, it was well timed and created even more excitement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, Dave, did you have any counter to the important for, uh, no for the counter, process? No counter. Same page. I thought it was a really cool use case. All right. Excellent. So let's go to nothing. <laughs> Pretty much nothing. <laughs> the name of the <laughs> I mean, no all category the in. <laughs> yes. Well, yesterday, John made the argument about how you know we're moving into you know kind of this physicality our assistance but i i can't justify this one as important i'd have to go i'd have to go optional on on this one it's literally just you activate chat gpt by pushing a button on the on the headphones i mean yeah no i'm, I'm I'm there, and 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 the phone. You know, I was trying to figure out. I, I didn't know what this phone was. It's just an Android phone. You know, the rate, the the it seems like it's just another thing. You know, I don't know. I don't know who this person is who's getting the backing. You know, the, it's supposed to be a big deal. The but yeah, and it's just product overhead. I mean, announcement wear. Nothing. 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 Yeah, I knew nothing about nothing, so I also had to Google it, and it turns out they're not certified for all of the cells, the, the cell providers. Um, they they are uh, they they have you can work with AT and T, I think, but it's not even certified for that. So I, I'm I'm good with optional as well. Yeah, I, I, would, I would continue the trend here for optional. I love the idea of wearables, but I'm waiting for the major players to make my Siri smart to talk to my pods. You know, that, that's what everybody's waiting on. And this isn't bad. So optional. All righty. Yesterday, I saw a couple of people with a little pin that was like red. It seemed like it was sending. I don't know if you guys noticed that. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what it was? Um, no, I did. I was talking to Ted Shelton. He had one on, but I didn't uh, probe on it. I wonder if now you're getting paid to just walk around and gather all the images <laughs> and all the data yeah. of the world, you know, just walk around. Yes. Um, all right, let's move on to the next one. I think that's the last, we're heading to the last article. That's our last one. 
did Dave freeze or am I, am Dave, I frozen? Dave froze, yes. Uh, okay. I thought uh, Lingo. Next one is Lingo too. Yeah, I can, I, I can, uh, uh, and I thought the Lingo thing, uh, I didn't like the, the, let me put a different, I went back to Lingo itself. I didn't like the Twitter announcement thing. So let me see if I can share my screen here. You guys there? Yes. Oh, oh okay. Sorry. Uh, I'm just getting confused on my stream yard thing. Okay. There you go. Hotel Wi-Fi strikes again. Hi. You there? <laughs> yeah. Can you, that you want me to present or you got it? I can, I, I'll bring it up again. I've uh, tethered to my phone now. So hopefully that helps. Well, I, yeah, I, okay. There, we can see it, David. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought uh, I, I, I went and looked at a different article on their website, which gave more background than I could find on this X link. And I thought that that was really cool. I put it as important because I thought it was really cool that they're going from the large language model into a functional model of driving. Um, and they actually show you the driving car and all that other stuff, but that the, you know, it would be just another, you know, driving model, except for the fact I, they claim, and I think it's true that they're the first one to go from language model to driving function. And I think that that is a profound and important difference um, that, you know, you, th this is where I get, and this just like shows that I'm a nerd. I'm getting goosebumps talking about it. The uh, when you think about like the ability to go from uh a language model of the world back into functional capability. That is just profound in terms of the extension of AI uh, and generative AI. And I think that's where, I think that's at its core to me, that that is the most important function of Gen AI is to be able to go from different data types and to move the directionality from functional model. Well, you know, you look at robotics and stuff, you had all these functional model things you had to do before you could do, and it didn't deal well with novel environments. Now you're just saying, oh, screw it. I'll just interpret the world and then I'll figure out the function back from that. That is very, very different. Yeah, you know, last week that I was at the Google conference, A21 Labs founder was there and he was talking that they're really shifting their approach to task specific models. They call them TSMs. Um, which I think is kind of along what you're saying, the functional aspect of it. Yeah. And then yesterday in one of the presentations, uh, I can't remember who, who was the speaker right now because there were so many, but they were talking about more and more, it's about creating very specific agents and then a layer on top, right? That decides which agent you use, but that you're better off developing you know, agents that are very, very good at a specific uh, topic, a specific, specific task. So I do think that that will be, um, you know, how we're going to move forward. So I'll give it, I, I back you, John. <laughs> yeah. Chris, where are you? I, I love the idea of a multimodal model uh, and its impact. We don't even really understand how big the impact will be. Uh, I remember when I was in college, I, I drove black cars, especially like in Manhattan and in the Hamptons. And the uh, person I'd usually be driving would be like, well, take a left or like, give me the best routes imagine talking to your car and saying oh you know what take this route instead and it would process that language to drive you where you want to go super phenomenal concept and almost science fiction so yeah. i think it's a really essential idea that people see the the coming movement of of technology i mean there's a lot of bureaucracy to actually have that on the roads yeah. But, um, you know, the technology seems to be coming quickly. So uh, a really cool demo. So you give it essential. Yes. I could support essential. I mean, I think it's, yeah, it's the, to me, it's the directionality of the directionality of causality is changed. And that's, that's huge. Mm -hmm. Dave. I was on the important camp. Um, all right. Oh, I just, I, what are we? It's Friday. You don't want to give people too much to read, right? <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, that's exactly why they should. They have the whole weekend to read things. But like, what is going to be the impact of this model? Like, is it going to be used? Is like Waymo going to pick it up and put it in? Like, we don't know where it's going. So I think it's impressive. I wouldn't right. elevate until central until we actually like see what 
it's going to do, right? Lingo one, I mean, had we ever heard of that? No, like it didn't really do anything. No. So <laughs> so I, I, I want a little bit of proof first. All right. Very good. All I, right. I could be back down. I love the concept. I, I'm, I'm also like, I, I want people to see what the future of AI is and it's really multimodal. So that's an essential concept. This is, uh, I, I could back it down off essential yeah. a little bit for you. Yeah. All right. The Let's keep inflation down. <laughs> so the, the future is multi, multi, multi expert, multimodal. That's right. And functional. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, task specific. Mean functional right? is kind of part of the multi expert thing. Yeah. Multi -expert, I, yeah. What, All what, right. So since we have a few minutes, a few minutes. I would love to just one takeaway from everybody from the conference yesterday that really stuck with them. Um, I think this the thing we just talked about, I think that I'm getting more and more convinced it's multi multi and, um, and, and it's multimodal on the, on the model side, it's multi multi. I guess the other thing is this directionality that the, where the, where you begin and the vector of learning and how it drives like the explication and use, whether it comes from a task as you're saying, you know, Tanya or whatever. So I guess there's three things for me, multi, multi and direction. The direction can come from the data out into from the reality back through. And, and because of the multi thing, the, the door you open could be language, could be radiological images, could be God knows what, you know, in terms of, of direction. Um, and, and of course, all the stuff around data. But I think that's well known to anybody, you know, it's like, you know, your, your, your data streams. Um, the other thing is, I, I, I was really, and I suppose it's MIT Media Lab, but I was really impressed as to how little understanding of economics uh, there is in the main in this field. Like the people from the consulting companies are saying generalized pablum and, you know, um, the, the scientists weren't, they, they know so little about uh, organization and economics, you know. So I guess I was a little bit surprised at the naivete um, of, of the of the application domains and and what what executives really care about but you know what the heck it's the mit media lab yeah <laughs> i had yeah. two takeaways dave um because i know we're running out of time to me it was energy and then data uh, like like john said on the energy side you know you're just seeing a lot of people more focused than last year on how much energy all of this is going to take and that we need to take that into consideration so that last panel um interview of liquid ai I thought was phenomenal on what they're doing in order to to make things so much simpler and and not to consume as much energy, right? And he in that company spoke, I think, right after, right before the the gentleman who has who runs the the supercomputing center up and um, so to just you know see the 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 you know the amount of energy that all of this power that all of this requires. So that was a, a, a takeaway. And then the second on the data side, yeah, we all understand how important data is. But there were a couple of comments that I thought was was like, hmm, you know, so we've always been thinking multi-cloud is better for the enterprise owner because you're not locked in. However, we're making our lives much more complicated now in this world of generative AI. So in a few of the talks I, I, I heard almost like, hey, you know, think about having your data like in one place. So does that mean one cloud? Are we going to like now start making decisions? I'm just going to work with Google, put all of my data there. I'm just going to work with AWS. So that kind of sparked my interest. Um, so those were two topics, so two take takeaways. How about you, Chris? So first, I it was the AI is this generative shift. It's obvious. I've never seen anything like it. There's so much excitement from so many fields of so many brilliant people that have been working on these problems for such a long time that had no market fit. And it seems that within a, less than a two year period, this very difficult science is now in our hands and it can be programmed with natural language. And it, it's a tremendous power, right? So that's one. The second is the community. You know, um, I, I've been in technology for a long time, but um, starting my group, ChatGPT for Business and Life, you know, it's been a great way to grow community. and. Um, meeting so many people from this internet community that were early adopters that came in one place to really celebrate AI, learn and see how it can be applied to better the world. Um, I felt that was sort of the heartbeat yesterday. That, that, that was a really cool space. So Boston has a really great placement in the ecosystem and you can really see their leadership. So um, great to see everybody there and great to see what will come. Yeah, I, I, I will add one other thing, which is 
just the speed with which you know this thing is happening. You know, the whole the, the difference between people who are like in it and regular life. And the example, there's this woman from Cerebrus that she's holding up, she's holding up a a, a, a wafer, you know, that had a trillion, uh, that had a trillion transistors on it. And, you know, you could do, you, it, it was basically the, 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 the compute power of like a hundred G 100s from NVIDIA. And she's holding up about the, and she's like national science foundation. I mean, national security agency and, you know, big banks and all other stuff for our customers and things. And, <laughs> and the, the interviewer, you know, at the end of her lightning talk said, so what's next? I turned to the guy next to me. I said, isn't that enough? I mean, <laughs> <you know? laughs> Yes, yeah, versus, I think uh, I you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. don't even it's get anything amazing. bigger, right? That, that's as large of a wafer as you can even print. I don't think yeah. that it's even possible to go larger. You have to go yeah. to a new yeah. medium. Yeah, for me, I, I had three quick ones. Uh, two of them have to do with coding. Um, one is just I feel like it was clear here, and yes, we were at MIT, but I, I believe it. I think we're uh, the community is underestimating the power of natural language coding and what that's going to provide. I mean, that use case alone, if we never go any farther <laughs> with generative AI is going to like just change everything because the amount of innovation that's going to be able to take place now, I think people can't really fathom what's yeah. going to happen, the creativity that's gonna be unlocked among people that weren't able to express themselves through coding. Um, the other thing is related to that, which is the uh, theme I kept hearing about a lot was uh, the next kind of like step change is going to happen when uh, AI can truly self-improve. So when a model can go back and continue to correct itself, um, and you can picture that in coding alone, right? If you want to think of a concrete area, that that's really going to be like the next step change. So I thought that was interesting. And the third thing that Liquid AI panel, I had lost track of that company <laughs> after hearing about it, you know, a year or two ago. And I was blown away to hear that they're already working with 50 Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. um, their technology could be the next transformer. And, you know, I, I just was really blown away by what they're doing. And they've said, you know, there's a reason you haven't heard about us because we've been embedded with companies and we're really focused on how do we actually create value with what we've built here. Um, so I'm really excited to see where that goes. Yeah, another an, another data point on your uh, observation about citizen uh, programmers. You know, uh, my friend Tom Davenport, who's a prolific author and and is one of those guys that always finds the next surfing beach before anybody else does. Um, his next book that's coming out soon is uh, Citizen Coders. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right. Well, I think we can have a whole show just on on what we learned yesterday because it was very, very uh, inspiring, very sure. illuminating. But um, that concludes our our week and our Friday. Um, any announcements, uh, Dave or John? No, we have the oh, learning. By the way, Chris, thank you so much for being us this whole yes. week. You added so much to our yeah, conversation. Yeah, thanks. Great, right, Chris. Come back. Yeah, Come back. Well, and lovely having you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. So great to see you. So great to meet everybody like in person, uh, either from last year or for the first time, David. Very nice to everybody. Awesome. And uh, Learning Lab on Monday. I don't know what it's about, but be there or be square. <laughs> Have a great weekend, everyone. All right. Happy reading.